Yes. So first discussion. We are being told of a twin sorry, a 12-year-old patient who presents with weakness of her legs and later involved her arms. I was saying that whenever you hear or you see this, weakness began somewhere and later involved somewhere. It means that it's a progressive weakness, okay? So this girl, if you can picture the patient and his mom or her mom in front of you, this girl started complaining to the mom that, mom, I can't really stand and I can't walk. Oh, what is the problem? Okay, then a few days later, she can't even move her hand or her arm. So that is a progressive weakness. And so a progressive weakness, which begins from the lower extremities upwards, will be termed as what? An ascending weakness, okay? An ascending weakness. So in... For the MCQ takers, anytime you see in pediatrics that someone had an ascending paralysis, the first thing that should come into your head is Guillain Barre, but read on. Maybe they would they are not asking for the diagnosis or something. Okay, so an ascending symmetric weakness. Okay, so it's symmetric. Two of the legs are gone. Then later, two of the hands are gone. What do you think will happen next? Please hold on. If you have a symmetric, that means left and right, progressive ascending or ascending weakness, then you should think of GBS. Or one of the things you should think of commonly is Ghislaine Bar or Barry syndrome. Then if the weakness is actually symmetrical, but it is a progressive descending weakness, a, pro a symmetric progressive descending, it means that it began from the head to so typically the cranial nerve the cranial nerve. So the patient is there and then he can't move the eye. So there is oculomotor nerve palsy, okay? Cranial nerve three, he can't move the eyes. Suddenly, the face is also gone. Suddenly, he can't swallow. Then he can't move his hand. Then his legs. That is what a symmetric progressive or a symmetrical progressive descending, if we throw in an air back, descending weakness. You should probably think of botulism. Are we good? Are we good? Yes, yes, so I was about to ask a question that what are you scared of for this for this uh, lady? The way the the way the the way the uh, weakness is climbing up. What are you scared? Of for this lady that might kill her. Who can hazard a guess? Respiratory arrest. Exactly. Respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest. Because once the leg muscles, the hand muscles, the abdominal muscles are gone, the next muscle is what? The muscles of the chest. And then you know that the diaphragm is the what? is the principal muscle for inspiration. So to get to a point, this patient might not be able to breathe in air again. So if you are a facility and you can't do, you can't offer mechanical ventilation, this patient right after the clinical evaluation, you know, Guillain Barre is principally a clinical diagnosis. Right after the clinical diagnosis of a possible Guillain Barre or Guillain Barre syndrome, this patient has to be admit uh, has to be referred to a higher facility that can provide endotracheal intubation or mechanical ventilatory support, or the patient will die on you. That is a first introductory uh, statement I want to make. Now let's focus on the question. The question is asking us to identify the CSF, the abnormality on this CSF report. 
The question gave us parameters of the CSF here. We have glucose, we have appearance, we have cells, and then we have proteins. So countless times on, hey, please hold on, my dad is calling. Very good. And so for CSF analysis reports, just for the sake of those who have recently joined us, okay, I'll just go through. In exam or for CSF analysis, okay, it is actually divided, if you will, into about two components. Okay, we have a uh, microbiology, okay, CSF microbiology, and then CSF biochemistry. These are probably the, the two main divisions of the CSF report. We have the microbiological aspect and then the biochemistry aspect. But on this channel, or um, I mean, in this class, we've always used the mnemonic MOCPA. If you've heard of the MOCPA prayer camp, which began in Kumase, we just borrowed that too. So the MOCPA camp, okay, MOCPA C. So we said that the M stood for microbiology. So there are a lot of things that can be done when it comes to microbiology, including culture, isn't it? Including culture, so CSF culture. Sometimes we can gram stain the CSF sample, looking for bacteria, isn't it? So gram stain and microscopy. So you gram stain and then we look underneath the microscope. Now, when we talk of CSF culture, typically we are talking about bacterial culture, okay? But there are other things you can do on the CSF regarding uh, microbiology, I mean, the growth of organisms. For example, if you are looking for TB, TB, TB organisms, you may have to culture. And then the, the culture medium for TB is actually Lowensin Jensen, MCQ tickets. Please take note, once I have mentioned I'll ask Lewensen Jensen culture medium. This, and in fact, for pulmonary TB, for all forms of TB, the gold standard for diagnosing TB is actually by you by culturing the TB on its culture medium. This culture medium is actually a solid culture medium. A solid culture medium. And it will take about eight weeks for the organism to grow. So if you have a patient you are suspecting of having TB and you want to always make a diagnosis by using the gold standard, then it means you are going to take a very long time. That is why the nucleic acid amplification test was invented, what we call the gene expert. So the gene expert provides us with what? Provides us with a rapid diagnosis. Principally, it will take somewhere at least eight hours, okay, for the results to come. So it can identify the TB uh, bacillus, and then it can even provide information about the resistance of the TB, whether it is rifampicin resistant or not resistant. Please, you understand? Yes. Silent majority, do you understand? Yes, but... Good. Um... Now... The Lewensin-Jensen medium is the solid medium. The, the, there is a liquid medium called the middle brook. The middle brook medium. That one is very, is very expensive and it takes like four weeks. So it means that the solid medium actually comes faster than the, the liquid medium, sorry, actually comes faster than the solid medium, but we don't have time to wait. But that is why we invented the gene expert. So it means that cell or microbiology, apart from the Lewensin-Jensen medium or using the middle Brooks medium, you can actually do a gene expert looking for what? Looking for um, the cause or the organism causing the, uh, the meningitis, as it were, for example. Or you can do um, um, a PCR for the virus. Polymerase chain reaction, PCR, for viral DNA or RNA. Okay, so all these are under the microbiology. 
Then O stands for opening pressure. O stands for opening pressure. So the normal opening pressure of CSF is actually from five to 20 centimeters of water. Then P stands for proteins. So you want to know, so this is where the microbiology, uh, I mean, the chemistries begin. P stands for protein. So we want to know um, how much protein is in the CSF. Then G, oh, okay, I think I should have gone to G before P. So G stands for what? Glucose. So you want to check the glucose content. And then A stands for appearance. And then C stands for the cell type. When I say cell type, I'm talking of the white cell. The cell type and how many there are. So the nature of the cells there and then how many there are. But sometimes the cell type can also include the red blood cells if you are thinking of subarachnoid hemorrhage, isn't it? Yes. Cell type and count. Yes. So now you go to the question and then you see that the question gave you glucose for that same woman who came with the weakness. The glucose was, I think it was, um, was it 20 or so? Yeah, 20. Let, let me go and check. I've forgotten my own question. I think it was 40. 40, good. I think it was 40, yes. Yeah. So let's, let's go back. Okay. The glucose was 40. Yes, so the glucose was actually 40 millimoles. Anytime you ask to do a CSF analysis and then they ask you what other investigation would you do with the CSF analysis, what will you tell them? You do a venous blood glucose, isn't it? What other investigation would you do together with the CSF sample you are taking. I will do a venous blood glucose. Why? Because you can only tell if the glucose is high or low by comparing it to the venous glucose, okay? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, so the RBS here was 50 millimoles per liter. Yeah. So we know that for CSF glucose, it should be at least two thirds of what is in blood. So if you have someone CSF glucose, which is less than two thirds of what is in blood, then we, you say that the patient has a low CSF glucose or the term is hypoglycorrhea. Is Maulam here? Yes, though. You remember the mnemonic for the layers you go through when you are doing CSF analysis? Yes, The mnemonic you created, okay. Yeah. All right. That is good. Then we are told that the appearance the appearance is clear. So here, from here, if you look at 40 and then 50, I mean, it is obviously more than two thirds, isn't it? So the patient hasn't got any glucose problem. The appearance is clear. That is how CSF should look like. Then we are told that for the cells, there were no WBCs. But the proteins was elevated. The patient had 240. And then we are assuming that the normal uh, CSF protein should be about, say, 4 to um, 160. So this patient obviously has a high protein, isn't it? Now, whenever you have an elevated protein, the cells there, I mean, there should be a concurrent rise in the number of cells. The CSF is not a pool of proteins. Once you see proteins, you should at least see some cells. So when the proteins are rising, the cells should also rise. Whenever you have an elevated 
CSF protein. Whenever you have an elevated protein in the CSF, but the white blood cells are normal, normal white blood cells or normal cell count, normal cell count, there is a dissociation between the protein CSF and then the cells. And you know that the most abundant or the most principal plasma protein, which in effect will translate to the proteins in the tissue fluid, isn't it? And then the spaces is actually what? Albumin, isn't it? Yes. So because there is a disparity or there is no correlation between the elevated protein and then the cell count, we call this phenomenon albumino cytologic dissociation. And whenever you have a patient with an ascending paralysis, one of the investigations you do actually is CSF analysis. And if you see this albumino cytologic dissociation, then you have GBS or GBS is suggestive. You get it. And so in answering the first question, in answering the first question that identify the abnormality on this CSF report, there is no, there is no, okay, so because this is um, man Oski, you are supposed to say it right in front of them. So your answer, you don't begin by saying, sir, please, is it? You don't begin by saying that. Catch your sleep. Sir, please. I see an albumino cytologic I see an albuminocytologic dissociation. That is what you see. You tell them, sir, please. I see an albuminocytologic dissociation on this CSF report. Say it confidently. Sir, please, I think I see. No. Command the atmosphere. It is only five minutes you are spending with them. And they can't use that five minutes to tell how good you are. You have to tell them how good you are within that five minutes. They don't have to decide that. Sir, please, I see an albuminocytologic dissociation on this CSF report. Evidenced by... Elevated... CSF protein but a normal Y cell count. Have I communicated? Yes, sir. Thank you. So now let's use this opportunity to talk about GBS. And I think when we talk about it, the following questions would, would be answered, isn't it? All right, so you want to be aware of the fact that you can have GBS in pediatrics. For example, one of the, um, I mean, pediatric history station, that's what I wanted to say. They had um, um, a case of, I think, a, a 10 or 12 year old child who um, woke up suddenly and saw that he can't move his one half of his body and then strictly this was this was actually um a stroke in possible uh, uh, impossibly a sickle cell disease patient that is in ghana the, the the patient probably had sickle cell disease but they will not tell you so one of the things you should, you should be thinking of is sickle cell disease with stroke you can also be given a history station that this child complained of weakness in the legs first and then later the limbs, take a history. I mean, the hands, take a history. 
then you should think of GBS. So we need to discuss Gulen Barre syndrome or GBS. Gulen Barre or Bar, depending on which school you went to, you can choose to say it however you like. It's a noun. Gulen Barre syndrome. I should make you aware that it is also called acute AIDP. It is also called AIDP. So when you get the clinical vignette in your MCQ and then you see what is the most likely diagnosis and you are eager to see Guillain Barre syndrome and to your disappointment, you didn't see it. When you see acute inflammatory when you see acute inflammatory demyelinating that's a t acute inflammatory demyelinating poly that's a p poly radiculo neuropathy Choose that. It's the same as Guillain Barre syndrome. So the Guillain Barre is actually named after somebody, but the real medical diagnosis is this. Okay. The real medical diagnosis is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. You might also see another name as acute idiopathic polyneuritis. Acute idiopathic polyneuritis. Guillain Barre syndrome, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, acute idiopathic polyneuritis all mean the same thing. Now, in explaining this long name, this is what we mean. You will see that we are saying there is a polyradicular neuropathy. When we talk of neuropathy, neuro has to do with the neurons, pathy has to do with the disease. And so neuropathy is actually, in plain terms, a disease of neurons or a disease of nerves because you know that the peripheral nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system, isn't it? Remember that principle I taught you for MCQ tickets. Okay, so the disease of the nerves. Good. Now we are saying radiculo. So neuropathy, radiculo neuropathy, poly. Poly just tells you that it's more than one, okay? Of course, it's more than one. That is why the, the patient has what a large or a progressive muscle weakness. If it was only one nerve that was affected, the as ascending, the weakness wouldn't have ascended. So it is poly, that is why it is given as a large area of muscle weakness. Now, if you remember your JHS and your primary um, environmental studies, environmental science, you see that, or even SHS, you see that when we talk of radical of a plant, we mean the root, the root of a plant, then the plumo or the shoot. Do you remember? Yeah. Or oh, that one you've forgotten. Plumo, and then so whenever a plant is growing, its radical is inside the soil, and then its shoot or plumo is I am, I mean, outside of the soil. That's what we see as a stem, which will eventually give the leaves. And so the root is in the Latin is a radical. A radical. Now, let me pause here and then tell you that if you remember the, the cross section of the spinal cord, if you remember, I'm going to draw it. Augustine, are you here? Augustina? Yes, please. I'm here. 
Hello, can I be heard? Yes, I, I heard you. Sorry for not oh. responding. All right. Are you here? Um, please, the rest, are you here? So I'm drawing the, the spinal cord. The cross section of the spinal cord. Let me just add this up. Yeah, you remember the H shape here? Yeah? Regina, do you remember? Yes, please. Then this was a central canal. So this was what? This is the anterior surface of the spinal cord. That is, if I should make it a three-dimensional picture, you see that the spinal cord actually looks like this. So this is the anterior surface of the spinal cord or the anterior part and this is the posterior part or the dorsal part you know that out of the spinal cord comes roots isn't it mm -hmm. so we have the roots which come from the dorsal part they are called the dorsal roots okay the dorsal roots and this is the ventral root. Remember that posterior actually stands is the same as dorsal. Anterior is the same as what? Ventral. Now, Suma, do you remember? So this ventral. is the ventral root. The dorsal root. The dorsal root is actually made up of sensory nerves. The nerves which carry sensations, okay? And then the ventral root is made up of motor nerves, the nerves which are what's bringing out motor command from the CNS, knowing very well that the spinal cord is also part of the CNS, motor nerves. So you know that the root will come and then the dorsal root actually has a ganglion. That's a dorsal root ganglion. Okay, this one, the ganglion. Now my point is that the two roots will join to form the nerve. So if you see maybe um, the, the L1 nerve, okay, when you see the L1 nerve, what you are saying is that you had a dorsal root coming from the spinal cord at the level of L1. Then I'm, I'm just giving an example. Then the ventral root also came. Then they joined to form a nerve. Now, this nerve, this peripheral nerve, is what is going to eventually feed effector organs like moto, I mean, like muscle. Remember that. Sensations are coming like this into the spinal cord. And then motor, motor nerves are also coming this way to go and feed muscles, to go and feed glands. Maulong, are you here? Yes, dog. Good. So when we say radiculopathy, this is where the, the lesion is. It affects the roots. Are you getting my point? So, polyradiculopathy, polyradiculopathy, poly, oh, hey, Charlie, I'm very good. And so when we say polyradiculoneuropathy, this is what we mean. Polyradiculoneuropathy, this is what we mean. So it means that it is not only L1, in fact, L2 is affected, L3 is affected, and the pathology is this place. That is what we mean. So now we are saying that it is a demyelinating disease. So AIDP, so we are explaining it one by one. Polyradiculo 
neuropathy, we've explained it. Now, demyelinating. What it means is that when we say that the nerves are diseased, it doesn't mean that we have severed them. The nerves in this area, we have cut them into pieces or no. It means that the, the, the myelin sheet around, around them, okay, we are removing them. We are removing them. We are removing them gradually. And let me ask you again, MCQ takers, um, who is here? Um, Debbie, yes, Debbie. Deborah. Yes, sir. If this patient, if you met in the MCQ, that this patient has survived, okay, this patient survived, which cell would be responsible for replacing the myelin sheet? I'm not sure. Debbie, I'll beat you. Okay, you'll be sure, okay? By June, you'll be sure, eh? Okay. Good. Um, who is here? I don't want to call Nasuma. Um, Akosia? Yes, dog. Yes, which yeah. cell will be responsible for replacing it? The Please, I'm thinking sure. of the Schwann uh -huh. cells. It's the Schwann cells. I'm thinking of the Schwann cells. It's the Schwann cells. Debbie, do you remember? Mm. Debbie? Yes, doc. Do you remember? Uh, oh, or, or maybe you have not watched okay. that lecture. Eh? Yes, please. You have not watched it. Okay, so Akosia, if there is a demyelinating lesion in the spinal cord and then the patient survives it, the myelin sheet have been, has been replaced. Which cell would be responsible for doing that? Yeah. Akusia, yes. Go ahead. You've forgotten. Um, which cell? Mm. Okay. Now, Suma. The oligodendrocyte. Do you remember? So when it comes to myelin sheet production in the central nervous system, it is done by the oligodendrocytes, but in the peripheral nervous system, it is done by the Schwann cells. That was just by the way to remind you not to forget. All right. So it's a demyelinating disease. It means that reversibly, what we are what we are removing the Schwann, the the I mean the myelin sheet away. Then it's an inflammatory condition. So what is causing the demyelination is actually an inflammatory condition. And it, and it occurred over an acute period. Okay? So that is the meaning. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. Have I communicated? Class, everybody. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Now, if you watch this carefully, it presupposes that the patient wouldn't just complain of weakness. What would the patient complain of again? Look at this. So in addition to weakness, what would the patient complain of? Yes. Sensory loss. Sensory what? Problems, isn't it? Yes. Sensory problems. Sensory problems or sensory deficits. But you know that myelin sheet is, is needed by the motor neurons more than the sensory neurons. Do you know that? Because the motor neurons have to be firing, firing, firing. The sensory neurons, not so really. Okay? So since it is a demyelinating disorder, you would agree with me that the motor deficit is always greater than the sensory deficit. Isn't it? Yes, Thank you. Can I clean the board? Yes. So AIDP, most of the times we don't, we don't, we don't really, we can't say that for hundred percent sure this is the cause. But it is thought that it is thought that it is an autoimmune process. So the cause is not really understood. But many authorities believe that it is an autoimmune mediated pathology. It is an autoimmune process. What are the triggers? 
what would trigger someone's nerve roots to just be demyelinating like that in an inflammatory condition? Infections. So in 50% or in more than 50% of cases, in more than 50% of cases, infections are what? Culpable. But sometimes, or rarely, I should say, rarely, when you ask the most common trigger is infect infection, but rarely, surgery can also trigger it. a patient who just underwent vaccination. But these are very high polluting and very rare, but I want you to keep in your head. When we talk of the infections involved in Guillain Barre, the first one we want to think about is Campylobacter jejuni. So if you had this and then you are asked, so what infection really precipitated this? The answer is this guy, Campylobacter jejuni. Apart from Campylobacter jejuni, other infections that can uncommonly precipitate this process are enteric viruses. Enteroviruses. And then herpes viruses. Herpes viruses, principally CMV and then EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Please, have I communicated? Yes. Thank you very much. Can I clean the board? Now, if you have a patient whose weakness has progressed for more than two months, weakness has progressed for more than two months, then instead of an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, you have a chronic, so two months is the, is the dividing line. And that would not be technically termed as Guillain Barre because Guillain Barre should be an acute event. Okay, so you have chronic inflammatory, so CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating. Poly radiculopathy. Two months. So what are the clinical features then? What are the clinical features? Now, before I talk about the clinical features, I want to bring, I think the MCQ guys, you've had a lecture on that, and I think the OSCE guys also may have an idea of what I'm about to say. But you know, for example, that when it comes to the motor fibers in the central nervous system, okay, we have those which come from above, okay? So when I say above, from the cerebrum, from the cerebral cortex, from the cerebellar cortex, cerebellum, from the basal ganglia, okay? Those motor neurons which come from above, then they come and synapse on uh, I think I mentioned this. Yes, I think I mentioned this. That someone was giving me a name. I mean, synapse on one other guy who would send the thing out. Hey, sorry. Who would send the signal out? Okay. So this guy. Augustine, are you following me? Yes, please. This guy is the upper motor neuron. He came from above. And this guy who would receive it in the spinal cord or in the brainstem or whatever, and then come out as a nerve is the lower motor neuron.
So you would agree with me that Guillain Barre, which of the neurons would it affect? Do you think it will affect the Augustina? Do you think it will affect the upper motor neuron or the lower motor neuron? Looking at the explanation we gave. Um, the lower motor neuron. Yes, it will affect the lower motor neuron because the lower motor neurons are those which what come out or yes, they come out um as the roots and then finally the nerves and then they are going to supply. Okay. So the radiculopathy actually will affect the lower motor neuron, but it will affect it, or the this will affect the lower motor neuron, but it will affect it at the point where it is coming out as a root, not as a nerve. Okay, so the lower motor neurons will be affected. Why did I bring this, this thing? I want you to know that patients with Guillain Barre would come with what? Weakness. You know, the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, all of them have weakness. But the lower motor neuron, the Guillain Barre will come with weakness plus what? Lower motor neuron lesion features. Anali. Anali, okay, she's not here. Hannah, are you here? Good. All right. So, what are the features of so, Ramu? Anali says her internet is messing up, so she left. Okay. All right. All right. That's fine. So. They would have lower motor neuron lesions. So, like I've always been doing, I don't mind repeating myself all the time because when I repeat, it enhances memory. I know I have written this already. I'll write again. You should not forget this in neurology. Features of upper motor neuron diseases or signs, and then lower motor neuron signs. But since we are talking about an upper motor neuron, sorry, a lower motor neuron condition let's bring it here and then contrast it with the upper motor neuron so one the weakness will be flaccid and one didn't be any flaccid weakness please with respect to the gbso these are the lower motor neuron, but upper motor neuron, we know it to be spastic. Spastic weakness. Again, we know that there will be what? There may be fasciculations in lower motor neurons. Fasciculations may be present. But if the upper motor neuron is affected in a condition, fasciculations are absent. Then we have, hey, Charlie, what else would happen? Because it's an acute process, you may not see the atrophy, okay? So let's not add the atrophy, but I mean atrophy, atrophy, is um, disuse atrophy or decreased muscle bulk. <laughs> Sorry. Decreased muscle bulk. Decreased muscle bulk is a feature of lower motor neuron, but not, not upper motor neuron. But I must say that in very long standing upper motor neuron diseases, you may in very long standing, long standing and casa, you may see atrophy or you may examine atrophy. The tone is low, hypotonia. But this one is what? Hypertonia. So upper, hyper, 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 hyper. What have I written? The reflexes, areflexia or hyporeflexia. Then it's what? Hyperreflexia. 
So the weakness is what? One with lower motor neuron signs. And like I said, so what can I clean the board? Yes, Remember that yes, this areflexia is actually what? It's actually um deep tendon reflexes. So the deep tendon reflexes are what? Gone or are absent. Deep tendon reflexes, like the biceps breaker reflex, like the uh, Achilles tendon reflex, like the patella tendon reflex, all of them are what? Down. Deep tendon Deep tendon reflexes are down. And then, of course, Babinski sign will be negative, isn't it? Yes, sir. Babinski sign will be what? Negative. But in upper motor neuron, it is what? Positive. You have those reflection of the toes and then what? Fanning out. That's positive. Or it can be what? Equivocal. It's neither positive nor negative. It is still a sign of upper motor neuron lesion. Is that okay? So summing yes. everything up, summing everything up, if I can clean with your permission, summing everything up, the clinical features of um, Glenn-Barry is actually flattened paralysis. Or flaccid weakness with Symmetrical paresthesia, that is what, the sensory deficit. Symmetrical paresthesia. Symmetrical paresthesia, but remember that the paralysis, the paralysis, and what we wrong? Missing the amount, right? Yeah, I'm up here. Five cities? Yeah. Okay. So the paralysis is greater than the sensory deficit. Please remember that. Good. And then I should mention that although the muscles are affected, usually the sphincters, okay? The sphincters are affected. The sphincters are, sorry, they are spared, not affected, they are spared. So although there is weakness in the legs, the patient still has bowel control. You get, he still has bowel control. Why? Because the anal sphincter, although it's also, it also comes from the roots, from the spinal cord, for some reason, the sphincters are affected, are spread. So the patient has bowel control. The patient has bladder control. The reason is that the sphincters as are, are spared. So the bowel control, the inner sphincter is spared. The urethral sphincter is spared. Although almost all the muscles below are affected. So I should mention that Guillain Barre disease or syndrome is actually self limiting. When we say a disease is self-limiting, it means that God in his own wisdom has programmed recovery. But because of some complications that can arise, like the respiratory arrest because of diaphragmatic paralysis, the patient has to come to the hospital so that in case the diaphragm paralyzes, we can put him on ventilatory support until the recovery process sets in. Because if you have respiratory arrest, then what is the need for the spontaneous recovery? You will die even before you recover. Do you get it? So it is generally a self-limiting disease. And the weakness remains the same. So when the weakness starts, and then it, it becomes progressive to a steady state, let's say it started with the legs and now the hands, and it's not moving up again, it gets a steady state. The weakness remains the same. The weakness remains the same for a variable period of time. So the patient comes to you and then he sees that you've done your CSF, you've done a whole lot of things, and then the, the mother is asking you, so doc, when will my child get better? Because I've come here and I've seen that now um, the weakness is still there just as it is. I mean, is she going to get better? We tell them that most of the times from what we have seen with so many cases of 
Gulen Bar syndrome, we've seen that it is a self-limiting disease and the weakness remains the same for some variable period of time. But principally, or typically, it lasts for a few weeks, only a few weeks, and then it resolves. Spontaneous resolution comes. Now, because, because it is it is going to be um, a, a, a progressive uh, ascending paralysis. Sometimes, the, I mean, it is ascending up, okay? So the, the pharyngeal muscles can be affected. So you may have to pass an NG tube. So for those patients who have, so you don't pass it for everybody. The patient now cannot swallow. Pharyngeal muscles can be affected. Facial muscles can also be affected. So for that period of time, for that variable period of time, like weeks and all that, where the patient has weakness in the pharyngeal muscles, facial muscles. This actually occurs in about more than 50% of uh, cases. Because the patient is not eating, is not feeding because of all these, dehydration can set in. That is what, another reason why the patient has to come, even apart from the respiratory arrest, has to come for what? Fluid, fluid, um, fluid therapy. Malnutrition can set in. So you have to pass an NG tube and start feeding via the NG tube because the patient can't swallow. So although it's a, a self-limiting disease, the patient has to be in the hospital. Okay. Now, sometimes, although the, the, the um, sensory and motor is affected, sometimes the autonomic system is also affected. So it results in what? Autonomic problem. This autonomia, remember that medicine is a language. So if you hear this autonomia, the autonomic nervous system, this, okay, like dysphagia, difficulty or a disease of what? Swallowing. So this autonomia can set in. Then the autonomic system now starts misbehaving. So you have some blood pressure changes, BP changes. So today it goes up, tomorrow it is down, like she's in shock and all that. All these are because of what? This autonomia. Then the patient can have syndrome of inappropriate ADA secretion. Remember, okay, that it can complicate a number of CNS or, I mean, nervous system uh, problem, I mean, uh, diseases. So you can have SAIDH, and I've taught you SAIDH, where the patient has what? An inappropriate secretion of ADA. Said that the patient hasn't got dehydration. The patient's hydration status is fine but he's still producing a lot of ADH and ADH is what? Absorbing free water from the nephrons into the blood circulation and it is diluting everything, causing hyponatremia. So the patient will have a very low plasma osmolality. Okay. Um, Augustine Ayaira, I've not heard, I've not, I don't, I don't know how your voice sounds. Can you, can you, can you, can you speak? Yaira. Hi doc, I'm here. Good. Very good. So those lectures will come, okay? I would send them in pulses to you. So we've done that. So you see that because there is ADH secretion like that, we are absorbing a lot of water from the tubules we don't need, making the patient produce cantiurine and making the plasma what's more dilute, causing hyponatremia. And I've said that whenever a question comes that the most common electrolyte abnormality associated with seizures is actually low sodium. That can cause seizures and all that. Now, remember we said that the usually the sphincters are spared, but if the anal sphincter, which is controlled by the autonomic system, okay, is uh, I mean the urethral sphincter is affected. Sometimes the patient may come with what urine retention, retention of urine. That is what neurogenic. The patient will, will come with cardiac arrhythmias. All these are dysautonomic symptoms. Have I communicated? Have I made it very simple to understand? Yes, yes Thank you. Sir. Thank you. And so then, what investigation do we do? So we are coming to the question. What investigations do we do in a patient you are suspecting of having Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy. 
we have to do nerve conduction studies. So you see, we are we are we are we are just measuring because you know that if you remember one of the lectures we had, we said that this is an example of a motor neuron. Oh, oops, oops. this motor neuron is too funny. Okay, Anali, I've seen it. Okay, you by all means get the recording, so that is fine. So these are the dendrites. They receive the information, and then they send it to the cell body, and this is actually the axon. And remember that we need myelin sheet here. So the MCQ takers, it makes sense to think that when I'm teaching neurology and I get to Guillain Barre, I'll just skip or just brush through. Now, remember that these are fat laden, okay? When I say fat laden, they are made up of fat, the myelin sheet. Myelin is a form of liquid, myelin sheet. And in the peripheral nervous system, it is produced by the Schwann cells. Now, listen. The impulses are electrical activity. I mean, sorry, the impulses are elect electrical impulses are actually um they they can skip insulators. Okay. The electrical impulses, because they are charged particles, they don't like to be in, co in, in contact with hydrophobic substances like the myelin sheet. Have I complicated? Yes. So when the impulses are coming from this direction and then they get here, you see these spaces, the spaces between the myelin sheet, they are, what are they called? Have a, how, 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 how are they called? Node of Ranvia. The nodes of Ranvia, okay. So, two. Please hold on. Two, so we'll say nodes, okay? Nodes of Ranvia. Okay. Now, when the current gets here, because of the insulation here, it will jump to this point. Do you see that? Because it doesn't want to be in contact with any insulator. Do you see that? Yes, so it gets here, it starts traveling, it jumps, it skips the insulation point. What do you think it does? It means that the presence of the myelin sheet actually permits what? A faster conduction to the muscle so that the muscle can contract. Do you see that? So if you have if you have a demyelinated um neuron, like what I've indicated. Oops. Okay, let, let, let's keep it this way. So if you have a demyelinated neuron, what do you think will happen? The conduction will be very slow because there is no insulator. I mean, when it gets it, it comes here, it comes here. But from this length to this length, it will have to what, cross. It will have to go to the entire journey. But when you do the nerve conduction studies and electromyography, you are just testing the conduction in the nerve and then how fast the, the muscles conduct, I mean, contract. Do you understand? So you do a nerve conduction studies. That is one of the investigations done. 
nerve conduction studies and electromyography. You get good. That is one of the investigations. Then what will you do? CSF analysis. How long? Yes, God. Can you please give us the mnemonic that tells us the layers we will go through when we are performing lumbar puncture? Yes, dog. Please, um, I said three single leaders, but the leaders is like L E D A S. So it's three single, like S I. Come again. Three S, three S I. Three S I. Okay. Three S I. Now I I have it off my head, so it seems the mnemonic does not really help me. Well, I just brought this as a side note for you to take something home. You can actually make it three silly days. Three silly days. You know why I brought this up? Because you may be quizzed. In doing the CSF analysis or the lumbar puncture, which structures do you have to go through? 3S, Maulam, isn't it? 1I, L. So before we, we go through, let's do that. So three single leaders 3S, 1I, L, E, D, A, S. The first layer is what? Yes. The skin. The skin. So you have, you have to go through the skin. What else? Subcutaneous tissue. The subcutaneous tissue. What else? The supraspinous ligament. The supraspinous ligament. For well, Yaira yeah, and there is there's a video I showed I showed this on so you would get it okay then yes the, the interspinous ligament. When, when, you, when you see the diagram, everything will make sense to you. So the supra, hey, supra spinae to spa, mm -hmm. supra spinous ligament, the interspinal, so in between the spine and then above the what the spinous process. So, and then L for what? Ligamentum flavum. Ligamentum flavum. Excellent. E for what? Epidural space. The epi now you're in the epidural space where there are lots of blood vessels. E for what? The dura matter. The dura matter. Now you're in the dura layer. E for what? Arachnoid matter. Arachnoid matter. And then the S for what? You are in a subarachnoid space. That's where the CSF is flowing. Have you gotten it? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, like I've, I've already explained, the CSF would show you an albuminocytologic dissociation. Albuminocytologic dissociation. Are we good? Are you good? Yes. yes, so how how would you manage this patient? Of course, this was supportive care, isn't it? Supportive care. For example, 
the patient cannot walk. What is he at, at risk of? DBT, isn't it? So you may have to give thromboprophylaxis. But if he's a child, you really do not have to give. Okay, if he's a child, you really do not you, you don't have to give. But if he's an adult, you may have to give thromboprophylaxis. Please note that Julian Barry, in fact, let me use the mantra you've always been using. How would you manage? Please know that Guillain Barry is a medical emergency. It's a pediatric emergency. The songs we've been singing, it's an it's it's a medical emergency. So I will cancel and admit. Call for help. And assign rules. This, this is a song we always sing for emergencies. Augustina, did you get that? This is a song we always sing for emergencies. It's a medical emergency. It's a surgical emergency. It's an oncologic emergency. It's something emergency. So I'll cancel and admit, call for help, and assign rules. Then I'll do a quick primary survey. I'll do a quick primary survey, assessing for what? airway, breathing, and circulation, and appropriately manage any abnormality noted. Appropriately manage any abnormality noted. Like, like starting Supplemental oxygen, if the SpO2 is less than 94%. Now, because there is a tendency that the patient may have paralyzed um, pharyngeal muscles, the next thing you want to do is actually to do the swallowing test, isn't it? Swallowing test. Sometimes the examiner would not let you go through, oh, once you are seeing all these things, it's just a myth. Hey. But sometimes, oh no, you just tell me. What you can do so supportive care okay a swallowing test to assess swallowing and if it is negative you may have to what pass an ng tube to prevent aspiration and also for feeding and for administration of medications if possible or if indicated okay then supportive care so oxygen we've done that a uh, person on NG tube, patient, patient is not working to physiotherapy and do physiotherapy. All that as, is part of the supportive care. You can you can give um, oral feeding. I've talked about that. Oral feeding NG tube. Um, you can actually regularly turn in bed. Okay, we don't want the patient to have bed sore. So regular turning in bed. to prevent bed sores. And ideally, this patient should be in the ICU, not on the ward. It should be, it should be in the ICU, where they can what? They can closely monitor, closely monitor her breathing. Because we know that the thing is ascending. And once it gets into the Diaphragm, we have to what? We may have to what? Give mechanical ventilator support. So we are monitoring her BP, uh, uh, I mean, her breathing and then her, her SPO2 and all that. Because we understand the natural progression of the disease. And ideally, what we should be measuring is the first vital capacity. Ideally, but nobody has, we don't have spirometry like that. Okay, ideally. Please hold on. So, um, so thromboprophylaxis, perfect necessary. You have to give your fluid. All the, so all these are 
supportive care, okay? So whatever supportive care you think the patient, sometimes the patient uh, might need bowel bladder care. If uh, the patient can't, uh, I mean, has a retention and all that, okay? Um, then, sorry, I use a retention. Has loss of bladder control because of the disc or autonomia, okay? The patient might need bowel bladder care. Then, um, sometimes, or rarely, rarely, you may have to give IV immunoglobulin. Because remember we said that it's an autoimmune condition. So rarely, you may have to give immunoglobulins, IV immunoglobulins, or you can do plasma pheresis. You can do plasma pheresis. Plasma pheresis is actually plasma exchange. So it's like a dialysis. You are removing the suspected uh, antibodies, okay? Auto, autoimmune antibodies, which are attacking the, the myelin sheet. Have I communicated? Thank you. So when a patient comes like this, what are the various differential diagnoses? Apart from, apart from guillain -Barre, what could it be? Okay, what could it be apart from guillain -Barre? Someone comes with weakness. Yes, weakness, and it is symmetrical. It's not like it is one-sided for you to think that it's a stroke. It is symmetrical. I mentioned one guy, botulism. But the difference is that in botulism, in fact, I think the first person I should mention is tick paralysis. Tick paralysis. Tick paralysis. Yaira. Lesson, are you here? Tick paralysis. So the difference is that in tick paralysis, sensations will be spared. Note that sensations will be spared. And what happens? Why would someone be walking and all of a sudden he loses his, his power in his legs and then he doesn't understand? In tick paralysis, there is actually a tick bite. It's a tick bite from any of the ticks in the exodi, sorry, exodidae, okay, exodidae family. I'm teaching you this for a reason. If you don't meet it, you know where you meet it, right? If you don't meet it in pediatrics, where will you meet it? Who can guess? Home health. Community health. Come health. Come health. Uh, Take bites. Home health. And then this tick actually, or these ticks actually produce toxins. They are neurotoxins. Okay. So when you have an attached tick, especially to your scalp, a G, a G, um, tick bite. Now, not hair like so, tick. Then it, it bites you and it releases toxins into your system. It can cause the toxins are actually neurotoxic. Okay. So yeah, it's it the same as somber. I mean, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. So apart from the weakness, you may have impaired coordination. So it also affects the cerebellum in a way. Apart from the uh, uh, weakness, you have impaired conduction, you have nystagmus. I say, so I say impaired conduction. Impaired coordination, sorry. So this diagnosis is there and all that. And then you have nystagmus. So the paralysis is reversible when you remove the tick. You identify the tick and then remove it. All of a sudden, after some time, the patient will regain his consciousness. That is for tick bite, okay? Yes, sir. Then the next thing I want to mention as a differential is botulism. That's the next thing. Botulism. So in botulism, remember what we said. The difference is that there will be a descending weakness, okay? So usually it begins with a symmetrical cranial nerve pulses. So from up, from down, sorry, from up down, symmetrical cranial nerve pulses. 
So the patient will tell you that now, as uh, you start getting things like oculomotor nerve palsy bilaterally, facial nerve palsy bilaterally, abducent nerve palsy bilaterally, and all that. And just like tick paralysis, it, al it also does not cause sensory deficits without sensory deficits. It also does not cause sensory deficits. There is no sensory deficit, but in Guillain-Barre, there there is sensory deficit. And how do we get the, the botulism? When we get clostridium, uh, um, I mean, difficile, okay? Produces the toxin, the botulinum toxin. How do we get uh, in contact with this thing? When our wounds are affected. So that's what wound botulism. Sometimes you can even get the botulism without getting the infection of the organism itself, just getting exposed to the toxins. Maybe the toxins are in soil, okay? The toxins are in soil. And then you have a wound, you step inside, you have wound botulism. Or you can have infant botulism. It's very common among the infants. And here, the infant eats food that has been contaminated by the toxins or the spores of the um, Clostridium difficile. So that one too, what is the management? Supportive care, supportive care. And for well-meaning jurisdictions, they give an antitoxin. But line on to the same thing, supportive care, antitoxin, supportive care, antitoxin. Other differentials I won't talk about now are myasthenia gravis. We'll talk about it later. As those of you who have been with me for some time, we've spoken extensively about it. And then poliomyelitis. When a patient comes with weakness that has flaccid paralysis, lower motor neuron, you should think of poliomyelitis too, especially in children. Polymyelitis. And we'll talk about it when we are dealing with the picture stations in ComHealth. Have I communicated? Yes, sir. Is everything okay? Yes, sir. Good. And so, let's go. So the answer here is um, albuminocytology association, which acute events, it is actually what? A gas, an acute gastroenteritis. Principally with what? Uh, Campylobacter jejuni cosmet, isn't it? Diagnosis is GBS, and neurological signs you elicit flaccid weakness, and all the upper, the lower motor neuron lesions. How many did you get right? Who had who had four over four? Yeah, I did. Okay, I did. Okay. All right. Who had three over four? Oh, we are learning. I'm not assessing you. We are learning. I'm sure that when, when you get this, then you you won't you won't uh, get it wrong. And, and then, uh, mind you, me, I I make you write a lot of mocks. So these questions you are supposed to, you get exposed to them, so they become part of you. All right, it is fine. So let's 